Hi listener, this is From Ideology to Unity, a spiritual journey where we'll let go of ego and ideological doctrine in favour of meaning, purpose and unity as a whole. So, uh, I'm doing another reading of Quantum Theory and Free Will by Henry P. Stapp. On the floor there. Right, so um, how mental intentions translate into bodily actions? And I've given the published in detail before, but um, it's by Springer. Uh, yeah, Springer Nature. All right, so where were we before? We got to chap the end of chapter nine. So now where we're at now is um, chapter 10, questions and answers about minds. This should be interesting. So, the foregoing chapters have elucidated a science-based view of reality that I call realistically construed orthodox quantum mechanics. It is profoundly different from essentially new, from the, the the essentially Newtonian conception represented by classical mechanics. A comprehensive comparison of the two views in the preceding chapters has shown classical physics view to be inadequate in its treatment of reality compared to that of realistically construed. Did I say construed? <laughs> oh, it is actually construed. Realistically construed orthodox quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, that Classical physics view of reality is still employed by the most contemporary philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists working on the problem of the connection between the mind and the brain. I, come on, I comment on this situation by giving brief answers to the five questions that I was asked at a recent meeting. Question one, why bring conscious thoughts into the dynamical laws as, an independent, as independent inputs instead of allowing all mental properties to be determined by physical properties as in classical physics? Answer, Francis Crick, co-discoverer with James Watson of the double helix structure of DNA, was a leading figure in the movement to recognize consciousness as a respectable, acceptable subject for scientific study. His influential book, 1994 book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul, contains the following passage. You, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your vast sense of, of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. He maintained moreover that the laws of classical physics would generally be generally adequate in the study of world consciousness and that quantum physics would be needed only for tiny molecular study, molecular scale technical details. Crick's close associate, Christoph Koch, Koch, has become a leading figure in the neuroscience, in neuroscience, but has backed away from Crick's ideas to some degree. At a recent small meeting in Berkeley, prior to Koch's talk, one in a long lecture series on undiscovered problems in vision, I questioned Crick's claim that conscious thoughts are, conscious thoughts, are in fact no more than brain behavior. Koch promptly ridiculed the, that idea that there are, that are no yellow patches in the brain when experiences are yellow of yellow are occurring. The philosopher John Searle was also present at that meeting. John and I hammered away at the lack of any theory, understanding, of the connection between these two now admittedly different things, conscious thoughts and brain behavior. I also focused attention on the passage in the paper on integrated information theory, IIT, that Koch was expounding upon, which said IIT takes no position on the function of experience as such. It takes no position on whether experience as such does anything. But in this verbal response, it became clear that his position, like that of most neuroscientists, is that it is the brain that it is that the brain body that is doing every physically described thing, that our experiences are idle spectators that are created by the brain but have no reciprocal retroact. I keep mispronouncing things, mis very misphrasing things, sorry, reactive effect upon it. Our 
experiences have no reason within the classical conception of reality to exist at all, no job to do. However, the classical physics conception is known to be profoundly inappropriate and pursuing it has led to a growing number of very difficult unsolved problems in vision, ontologically construed RQFT is a radically different conception of the connection between our experiences and our brains that accounts rationally and in mathematical detail for all well-established empirical data from the planetary dynamics to atomic physics. In that conception, our conscious experiences play a critically needed dynamical role that makes your joys and your sorrows and your free will into the causally effective mental type realities that they seem to us human beings to be. How scientists view these matters is not just a matter of words, for those views control the research in fields of neuroscience and cogitative science. Question two, is it not true that the interaction of observed systems with the surrounding environment will account for the emergence of classical appearances and thereby eliminate the need for the extra process that orthodox and Copenhagen quantum mechanics introduced via the quantum collapse? Answer, the answer is no, it is not true. The interaction with the quantum, no, the interaction with the environment leaves the quantum state of the system being studied in a quantum statistical mixture, which is generally a continuous smear of the classically describable possibilities of the kind that we actually experience, each with zero probability to be actualized. To select the experience that actually occurs, some discrete selection process is needed. Now, give me a sec. I'm just going to make sense of what I just read here. So, isn't it true that um, interaction of observed systems with the environment? accounts for the emergence of classical appearances, which eliminates the need for the extra process so orthodox and Copenhagen mechanics introduces via quantum collapse. I don't see why he'd ask that question. I, I guess I'm just not understanding it. And the answer is no, the interaction with the environment leaves the quantum state in of the system being studied in the quantum statistical mixture, a continuous smear of classical described possibilities of the kind that we actually experience, each with zero probability to be actualized. To select the experience that actually occurs, some discrete selection process is needed. Um, okay, so The first question Okay, so these are questions he was asked, not the question he he was asking. Uh, oh yeah, I got it mixed up because he also mentioned um when he was at a a talk by Koch, but this is not that. This is when he was asked questions. All right. <laughs> Do not stop with me today. I think I'll be all right. Okay. Ah, hmm. So, Copenhagen and orthodox quantum mechanics deal with this need for, by means of an ordered sequence of two part reductions, each consisting of a process one free choice of a probing yes no question made by a conscious observer combined with a random choice of the answer yes or no made by nature. The free choice is free in the sense of not being fixed by the physically described aspects of the theoretical structure, either alone or in conjunction with the famous quantum random element, which is, or random inverted commas, element, which is connected to nature's choice. Now, I would say that connection is a pantheistic connection, which means that um, each soul is but put it in a law one sense, each soul, each observer, I am consciousness is um, it's like a slither of God, 
in a sense, like the God essence is divided up in many parts. Um, I suppose you could say that's the, is that the Holy Spirit? You could say in another sense, I don't know. But so in a sense that nature and our souls, our consciousness, that it's kind of one and the same in a sense, but it depends what level of analysis you look at. So anyway, without this two part selection process or some substitute, the theory would fail. In particular, the effects of the environment on the system of interest are not sufficient to account for which particular experience actually occurs. Question three. How do you account for results of the experiments of Benjamin Libet and others which show that an associated brain action called the readiness potential precedes the mental act of consciously willing one's finger to move? The fact that this brain activity precedes the willful act has been used by some authors to claim that the experiences of willfully causing the physical act is a consequence of the brain's causing the finger to rise, not a cause of that physical action. That view is in line with the physicalist theories of the mind, which claim that a person's mind is simply a feature of the physically determined activities of that person's brain. Answer. In order for a person to decide to perform a particular contemplated action, there must be a brain representation of that contemplated action. In Libet's experiments, the subject is instructed to perform a simple motor task e.g. raise a finger, at some future time, implicitly understood to be at some unspecified time in the next few minutes. According to the orthodox theory, this input instruction initiates a brain activity of constructing potential templates for action, for various alternative possible actions that meet the specified temporal conditions. The early phase of each alternative possible readiness potential is the consequence of the brain activity of constructing such a template for action, which involves also an account of the projected experiential consequences of initiating this action. Now, just in case you don't really understand what that's saying, I don't want to like belittle you by like assuming you don't get it, but like, um, this is quantum physics, right? And I, I'm assuming I get it, that is. I'm just gonna say how I understand that in a more simple way, I, if that helps. So, first of all, in the experiment, the person is, they're told the conditions of it, essentially. And that is, at an unspecified time, raise a finger. Now, my impression is that of this is that the moment they're told to do that, it kind of sets off a series of events in the brain, the mind, right? And one of those things is actually that there's a template for action uh, set up, essentially. Constructed, these are potential templates for action. Now, what is a template? Um, Typically, it's like it's almost like a stamp prepared in advance, right? And you just go and it's like you just do it, right? And it's like a pre prepared uh, response to something or action. It's almost like pre-programmed and then when the situation arises, you like do it or you choose to do it, right? And you've got various different templates. Like if there's like a computer game and there's various different like um, options and each, like suppose there's a character and they're, they're, going, they're moving around and they've got these different moves you can do with different buttons, do different moves, right? And like, um, or different keys do different moves. And each of these moves is basically a template. And each of these keys sets off that template. So instead of you literally micromanaging every single detail, you're controlling which templates it activates, right? 
So in a computer game, that at template would be essentially um, your process one decisions of what keys to press determine which process two um, templates play out in the game. Now, that might help you understand what's happening in reality where we're in a holographic reality, um, mind over matter, right? And there are these templates that we create in our mind and that basically we act out these templates by like making decisions about which template to do. So to speak, we say, is it A, B or C, right? Um, you've already kind of worked out responses to things and you just kind of pick which one you do. Now you can prepare different responses to things in advance and then choose different ones. And that way you can kind of potentially prepare different template responses. Um, and that, I guess, for example, shadow work and inner work can we do that, but also just ruminating of something can do that. Even negatively, if you ruminate negatively about something, or negatively, bitterly, whatever, right? You might have these negative, more negative templates that are more likely to be used. There's a whole bunch of templates, and these are just responses, essentially, that you can choose. And it's not just your actions, but it's also um, your views, your beliefs about what, rea what reality is, are kind of like templates about what manifests in your experience of reality. But in this case, it's talking about moving a finger. So, um, right, so you've got these templates for action. And um, there were various possible actions that meet this best world temporal condition. So you've got a various, you've got a set of choices, which are the templates which fit the conditions. So first of all, there's the conditions. But first of all, there's a set of templates. And then, this is just, this is what makes sense to me right now. And then those templates are filtered according to which ones fit the conditions. Then of the ones that fit the conditions, you slash and nature in a connected way, uh, pick one of those. Um, and since um, we are all one and all minds are connected in a non-local sense, um, then you're just one bit of, it's, the thing is, it's like normally your attention, your conscious attention, your consciousness is in one place, right? What is your awareness of that as one place? But source on a holistic level can have awareness everywhere at once. And you're one bit of that. You're one fingerprint of the overall conscious awareness, the overall consciousness. And that's why it works that way. So um, admittedly, I'm mixing in my own position, my own views with um, what the quantum physics is saying here. So keep that in mind. But Yeah, so, and basically one of those templates is chosen. And so as I said, the early phase of each alternative possible readiness potential is a consequence of the brain activity for constructing such a template for action. So you construct a, you, you construct a, a template for action and you pick one, right? And um, maybe it's saying that you actually build on the spot a template for action and then you act it out, but it kind of works either way. <clears throat> so, and then based on that, well, so, and the readiness potential is, what the readiness potential is, is, is basically, it's like a program waiting to play out when the, the, it's triggered, right? When it's, when the, it's like a race, right? And, not race. It's just like when, when when it's triggered, when the the spark is fired, it plays out, and it's, this involves also an account of the projected experiential consequences of initiating this action. So, the the potential, what the action, what the mind considers, the mind considers potential consequences in its construction 
of the template of your action and the readiness potential involves that as well. And then it plays out. Uh, and that would involve when and potentially how the finger rises, right? So, or moves. And that, that explains the movement of the finger in such a way where, well, before, that, that explains how there's mental activity before it moves, right? Or brain activity before it moves. And if they could say, well, I, I guess that proves that the brain determines that physical causes cause it beforehand, right? But the mind, this mirroring effect, the mental aspect, the aspect of your mind that isn't physical is going through this process and it's going to be mirrored in the brain right so because the brain in a sense is a physical manifestation of the mental activity right um it's a way in which it's hardware for playing out the the decisions of the human being like in a game the hardware is is the means for you're playing that game, a computer game, right? And different stuff's going to happen on a physical level in the computer based on what you choose to do in that game, right? But you can't play that game without that hardware there. And that's what the brain does, essentially. But it is in a fleshy way, I guess. But um, you can, yeah, you can't do it without that hardware. But at the same time, without you making decisions, that, that, that hardware is useless. Right, you're the spark of consciousness within it that, that that's kind of making decisions. But what they're saying is there is no spark. That the computer, that it's just like a simulation that starts with like, they were saying it's like, you know this, they're saying it's like an AI run game, right? And that there's certain set of starting conditions and these with the butterfly effect based on the starting conditions, in the game, it would just play out according to that in a kind of chaotic way, uh, in an unpredictable way, that's what chaos means, but like ultimately deterministic. And this plays out, number crunches, dun, 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 it's done. But the thing is, in reality, like there's no controller, like it's not a player, like there's not a player, like it's just, just a simulation. But the truth is, we are conscious and we are making decisions and we are. The player is like the observer I am consciousness in reality. You are the player, or at least you're just the observer if you're not actually actively playing. Um, it's like you just put, it's just like you're, you've got an automatic mode. You can actually actively play, but it, I mean, a lot of people, they only make a few decisions <laughs> a lot of the time. Uh, there's just on automatic processes a lot of the time. But, and they're so absorbed in watching that they kind of think that they're the, they think that they're, that they are the automated processes. Um, if that making sense. You might actually want me to carry on reading, so I'll do that. So <laughs> hopefully I've got it across in a way that helps. It was emphasized by William James that a contemplated action does not actually occur until an act of consent is given. That's the fire, right? It's not just, it's prepared in advance by you, the I am presence. And, well, the ego might be involved, but yeah. And then the fire is, that's the act of consent. That's the law of free will in law of one terms. And it, it is actually fundamentally key to reality. Even when you're, it seems like your free will violated. In a sense, it is, but not really, because you kind of consent without realizing you consent in a spiritual sense to things. Because what service cell beings do is they essentially trick you into consenting without realizing. Because the law of free will is a law of the reality. But consent, as we typically think of it, is kind of like.
we're talking about on a spiritual level. Um, in terms of, it's almost like the program of reality. It's kind of like, you kind of can unconsciously do it because it's still part of you. Your ego you, is a creation of you and is an extension of you, but one that is not, your awareness of it isn't fully there. Um, part of reality learning in, in this life is gaining awareness of yourself in a sense. Um, but in a sense, it's also just your flesh suit. So anyway, I'm kind of digressing, but you need to have that fire signal, right? And the thing is, if you feel that you have to, someone's threatening you, right? And they might be threatening someone you care about, or you might not want to get hurt, or you might not want to get shot in the head, right? In your life, it, technically, you still have free will because you can choose to not go along with it and get killed. I know that sounds like it's not free will, but if you, from the perspective of the fact that there's a soul that's living an eternal experience, whether you're in a life or out of life, that's kind of besides the point. Now, in in incarnation, from that perspective of free of consent, that's a different, it's talking about a different thing. In that sense, you know, you don't really have freedom, free choice, but in the sense of on a spiritual level, you technically do, you always do. It's just, it's not always what you want. And then there's the other thing, if you kind of create a own reality, so it's kind of the, the external is kind of an reflection of the internal, which means the situation where there's a gun to your head is kind of what you created or at least co-created. Anyway, um, that might take away, the, it might be, I mean, some people might say that it's kind of like, I was gaslighting because you're telling people that they brought it on themselves. It's, I mean, like, but people are not aware of what they're doing on themselves. So you can't really, this is not like saying, oh, it's your fault. You should feel like, I mean, it's not as simple as, oh, you just choose it, right? Like people aren't aware and often deliberately prevented from being aware. Like, and that's, that's an issue that, that really is an issue. So it's not blame, even though responsibility is there, but but it's not like, oh, just blame the victim. Like, it's, anyway, I'm digressing, I'm digressing. So, in the orthodox quantum mechanics account, the process of consenting or allowing the potential action to become part of the experienced communal reality is initiated by a process one probing action. As stressed before, this probing action is not fixed by the known physical laws. An initiating input coming from some other source is required. Libet, mistakenly from this quantum point of view, associated the rise of readiness potential with a decision to act. Then to rescue free will, Libet was led to his idea of a free won't, a later decision by the observer that can override the supposed prior decision to act. But according to the quantum model, the earlier part of this rise is merely a concomitant of the process of constructing a template for action that will only later by virtue of a mental choice be picked out from among the many potential templates that have been constructed in parallel by the Schrodinger equation controlled evolution of the quantum mechanical state of the brain of the observer. Um, you might be able to see that that's kind of fitting in with what I said. Um, as explained in the chapter on apparent backward in time action, the only one of the on, the only one of the parallel construction processes that will leave a record will be the one leading to the template selected by nature to be actualized. As in, you only see what's chosen, essentially by nature, and you. Uh, so it's kind of like. In economics, there's this principle called the broken window fallacy. It's a bit like that. The records of others are destroyed by the collapses. This explains the rise of the readiness potential before the subject's free choice of probing action that produces subject to nature's positive response, the physical action that actually occurs. Now, if you're a bit confused or missing something, or like, wait, wait, I don't quite get this. 
it's fine for you to go back, obviously, um, and listen again, uh, which I'm sure you know, but whatever. Right. The free choice by the observer of what to observe and when to observe it thus enters in an essential way into the course of physical events. Mind over matter, eh? Are effortful mental intentions thereby become causally effective in the physical world? Question four. Since mind is elevated to a basic role in your quantum view of reality, how do you distinguish those views from Western idealists such as Berkeley and from Eastern philosophies such as based on Buddhist and Hindu teachings? This will be interesting because it's possible he might disagree with me on this, but we'll see. All of these views arise from the empiricist premise that our understanding of reality should be based on the structure of realities that we already know exist. No, but upon me. All of these views arise from the empiricist premise that our understanding of reality should be based on the structure of the realities that we really know exist, namely our streams of conscious experiences. Since these various views all start from a mental foundation and seek to produce a rationally coherent parsimonious narrative concordant with the physically described character of what we see around us, it is not surprising that they all arrive at somewhat similar conclusions. But the Eastern virgins are more intertwined with Indian ideas of karma, reincarnation, and law than the Western virgins that evolved in the context of Greek thought, Christianity, and the rise of science. Parsimonious is like, well, I know unparsimonious means it's kind of like not what you want or what you're uncomfortable with. So consistent with how your view of seeing things or whatever. Um, that's what parsimonious means. Um, concordant means in alignment with, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay, question five. If mind is an important aspect of reality, then what do you say about the world before life emerged? Answer. I was asked the same question by Heisenberg in his solicited comments on my 1972 AJP article, The Copenhagen Interpretation. Mentioning Plato's notion of the absolute ideas, he suggested, brackets, MM and QM, page 76, close brackets, that perhaps it is convenient to consider the ideas as existing even outside of the human mind because it otherwise because otherwise it would be difficult to speak of the world before human ideas have existed. That answer is in line with the science-based conclusion in chapter 11 that the physically described reality represented by the quantum mechanical state of the universe is most rationally understood as an idea in a universal mind of which our minds are tiny, partially isolated parts. Mm. Nice cup of soup. So, a reviewer of this book emphasized the relevance of a 2012 paper of Schroeder et al. 21, in which the occurrence of self initiated movement events are triggered not by mental interventions, but by physical fluctuations of a leaky statistical accumulator. This model was applied to the case in which the stat the standard libit task of moving a thumb at an unspecified time is modified by an overriding instruction to immediately perform the specified action. The, the new action turns out to be preceded by a more extended in time RP, readiness potential, than when a less urgent, more relaxed demand is issued. So when it's more urgent, it's not a sudden change um, contradicting the prior decision, but rather the prior decision is earlier or they, the prior mental activity is earlier. It seems to be what it's saying, unless I'm misunderstanding, that, that's interesting. When it's more relaxed, there's actually less time. The empirically observed temporal evolution is an is in very good agreement with their three parameter fit, which they interpret as evidence in favor of their purely physical, physicalist model of libit type data. 
but it is not clear that it is evidence against the validity of orthodox mind dependent BN quantum mechanics. Indeed, the need for a template for a very sharply defined time of action would surely demand longer to prepare than one for a more loosely defined time of action. More precision with the same tool, the same brain, would require more preparation of time. It would certainly be a very major result if the Skurga data were to be actually incompatible with the orthodox von Neumann Copenhagen interpretation. So the Skurga result cannot be an actual problem for the orthodox mind dependent dynamics being described in this book. So the next chapter is the fundamentally mental character of reality. So this is actually quite a short chapter, so I'm just going to keep reading. What's the time anyway? Oh, we're good. <clears throat> actually, now I think about it, if this is a short chapter, and the one after that is also short. Ah, all right, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this, this episode for now. And I'm going to immediately go back to recording. <laughs> uh, but you can obviously watch this separately. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's pretty interesting, definitely. Um, pretty good insights about, you know, it, it adds to what I've been exploring so far. And it hammers at home further, I guess. And, and it shows that, you know, there, there are some potential responses to this theory. And it, it deals with them quite elegantly, I, I would say. So, yeah, uh, enjoy your day and bye for now.